Hello and welcome to Light Talk. This is Stan, and I'm broadcasting today from my state-of-the-art studio in the wintry swamps of Gainesville, Florida. Hi, this is Steve in Dallas, Texas. And this is David in Long Beach, California, and we are the Lumen Brothers! So, (laughs) on last week's episode, we discussed the fact that Ken Perchuk's son, Theo, happens to have a favorite show. And it just happens to be, guess what show it is, guys? Uh, Light Talk? With the Lumen Brothers! Isn't that crazy? That is crazy. (laughs) That kid is adorable. He is adorable. Matter of fact, uh, we have a a video that that Ken uh, sent to us with him actually saying, what's your favorite show? And he says, Light Talk! Light Light Talk! Talk. So, (laughs) So, it was so damn cute that Stan and Steve suggested that we give Theo some swag. However, the idea of mailing a hot, gravy-soaked piece of Light Talk pot roast across the country was not appealing to anyone. So instead, we decided to ask Theo to join us and sing lead on the Light Talk theme song. And that's right, you are hearing Theo singing the intro right now underneath us. So Theo, (laughs) it is adorable. And it actually sounds pretty good. Sounds better than me. Uh, So anyway, (laughs) Theo, the Lumen Brothers thank you for being our youngest listener. So, Steve, why don't you introduce our listeners to this week's special guest? Well, we finally managed to wrestle Kevin Lee Allen into doing the show. If our listeners don't know who Kevin Lee Allen is, let me tell you, he's an Emmy award-winning entertainment designer, artist, writer, and producer. He creates for film, theater, television, exhibits, events, fashion, corporate activations, and experiences. He has worked across the United States and on three continents. Kevin is a storyteller, a conceptual thinker, a leader, and a communicator who translates visions and ideas into physical realities. He's been called an architect of dreams. As an author, Kevin has written 12 books on entertainment design. Vector works for entertainment design, entertainment design, scenery, lighting, and sound with Vectorworks Spotlight, and Theatrical Design and Introduction. All are currently in print. As an educator, Kevin has taught or lectured at Carnegie Mellon University, Montclair State University, Rutgers University, and the Broadway Lighting Masterclasses. Kevin Lee Allen attended Montclair State University, where he obtained a degree in theater and the Lester Polikoff Studio and Forum of Stage Design in New York City. He is noted also for his extraordinary service to the community as a board member or leader serving the arts and business communities. In addition to the Emmy Award, Kevin Lee Allen's designs have been honored with the BDA and Promax Awards for television design. His design sketches are held in private collections and in the permanent collection of the Library of Congress. Kevin Lee Allen is a member of the IATSC United Scenic Artists Local 829. Kevin, did I leave anything out? No, I don't think so. I think that was pretty com- comprehensive. Thanks. Well, tell us a little bit about your career. Like you, like you just said, I'm a set lighting and projection designer. I've been working professionally since I was in college, and I don't really want to talk about when that was. <laughs> Join the club. <laughs> um, I work in theater, film, television. I create corporate experiences and brand activations, um, which... Part of my philosophy is that there's theater everywhere, and when I can bring that idea out into the general world, I like to. Um, One of our most recent projects was an installation in L.A. called The Happy Place, where we designed an upside-down room that is named Dancing on the Ceiling. And The Happy Place is an attraction or a diversion. People come, they pay their money, and they wander around, and they um, make fools of themselves, and they... um, (laughs) They take pictures of themselves doing crazy things, and then they share that on social media. Um, it's a big, like, it's a, it's a huge hit on Instagram. Uh, we've also done similar projects for brands like Budweiser. So that's sort of my my my, my career in 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 the nutshell. Um, but about ten years ago, I was asked to adjunct at Montclair State University in New Jersey, where I had attended. Um, and I was specifically asked to teach vector works along with design, rendering, decor, and other topics over the years. But um, as an adjunct, I became involved with the Kennedy Center American College Theater Festival. 
and I had seen a demo in New York of what was then ESP Vision and Vectorworks, and Jeremy Powell of um, Vectorworks um, came and did the presentation with AJ, who originally wrote Vision, um, and I invited them down because I was kind of blown away at the ability to really visualize moving light and rotating gobos and uh, fog and you know all, all the things that really make you know rock and roll rock. Um, and so after the demo, I was chatting with Jeremy and I talked to him about how I worked and how I taught. And he liked the fact that the, what I had determined were my best practices and workflow were then and now pretty much in line with how the program is built and how they hope people will work with it. And so he asked if I would uh, do some writing for them. And that was the first of about 10 books that I wrote for them. The, the first one was about 15 pages, and they worked their way up to over a couple of hundred. Um, those books were out there, and that led to Focal Press reaching out to me to write the book that has become Vectorworks for Entertainment Design. And it is. I got it. I think that's a pretty good it. textbook. Yeah. It's on my desk, it is. too. Thank you. I it's on it. my desk. <laughs> <laughs> my students read it. <laughs> I, 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 of course, I'm mostly concerned that your students buy it, but, you know, reading... <laughs> reading that they steal it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Because, um, you know, every student that buys it, I think I get five bucks. Um, yeah, that's pretty good. In, in, turn, in turn, after I wrote that book, the, 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 my, my editor said, well, what else you got? And so that um, led me to put together a proposal for theatrical design um, and introduction. And while the v Vectorworks books are really hands-on and filled with very detailed instruction, do this, do this, do this, do this, now do this, and you'll have whatever it is that I'm trying to get you to make. The, um, the entertainment design book, the theatrical design book, is um, much more philosophical it's sort of my methodology for um, analyzing a script, coming up with a design idea, communicating that idea to the other designers and the directors. Um, it's all the things that you would do, experimenting with color, experimenting with line, before you got down to try to making, making something with Vectorworks. Kevin, let me ask you one more question uh, before I turn you over to David. We have a lot of younger listeners, high school students, college students. And I think the question they would all like to know is, when did you first realize you could make a living doing this? That's a little bit hard, but um, I got my first job designing scenery and summer stock after my freshman year in college. It was a, a little itty-bitty place. It, it's still around. It was called, it's called the Surflight Theater. Um, at the time, it was tiny. It was maybe 60 seats. It had a tin roof. If it rained, we had to stop the show. Um, and I did that season. I did 14 musical comedies in 14 weeks and took my portfolio to meet um, John Kenley of the Kenley Players, which at the time was one of the largest summer stock companies in the country. I always made some money. I wasn't making any big money, um, but I made money and I was able to save money doing the summer work. Um, it wasn't until I graduated and moved into New York City that I realized I could totally earn a living, first as an assistant designer, um, secondly um, then as, as a designer. And of course along the way I you know, slung a wrench and I threw paint around and I you know, cut wood and, and, and did all kinds of things to work in the business and um, network. That's really cool. Um, you know, you're talking about AJ. I, we were one of the first people to use Vision, you know, right, right, right when he released it years ago. Oh, wow. And then I was so happy to see, you know, him finally get together with Vectorworks. And, uh, and it took several years for, for, for them to figure out how, how does Vision talk with Vectorworks? Because mm -hmm. I remember you had to, like, change the uh, fixtures on it. You went from one to the other. It, was, it just made no sense. But now it's much more seamless, which is great. The and process so is, a lot, is a lot smoother. Um, but and 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 it, even years ago, it was somewhat automated. As long as you had the Vision library, it could do the export. But now, once you send the file to Vision, I, you know, you can continually update it without having to go and recreate everything. Yeah, that's great. That's that's a big time saver. So, so so, how did you get started with Vectorworks? How long have you been using it? Uh, <clears throat> a very long time. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've. Uh, 
it was probably in the early 90s, and the program was still um, called Minicad at the time. Right, Minicad. Yeah. I still have the box, by the way. I oh, saw wow. It <laughs> <It's good. laughs> you could find that at flea markets. That's right. <laughs> it's a collector's <laughs> item. <laughs> Next to the saltwater dimmer. <laughs> the piss pot. So I have a, uh, a couple of questions. You know, I, I had my graduate lighting class today. And I told them that you're going to be on the show today. And they all went, oh, my God, the guy who wrote the book we're reading? Okay, ask him these questions. We need to know. <laughs> so I have a few questions that they asked me. And okay. we can make these short. Um, first of all, what's with the nun class and why not get rid of it? Well, you have, <laughs> <laughs> you have to have the nun class. Um, you can rename it and you can make that your, you know, your medium line weight or, you know, Bob's really favorite class, whatever you want to call it. it is, as long as as long as it's there, there are some things that go looking for the nun class. I tend to just leave it in my template file and ignore it. Whereas I have, for example, um, like an architect, um, I've renamed the dimension class, which you also have to have as um, D dash dimension, so that I can keep all of my notes all of my, the classes for my kind of note things like D dash drawing label or D dash center line gang together in the class menu, but you have to have it. Hmm? Now here's, here's kind of an esoteric question. Can the escape button exit out of a group or editing a symbol? No. <laughs> so you said short. keep it short. Not so esoteric. <laughs> that, 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 that's short. I love it. So, so if you're if you're asking me why can it do that, I, I I don't I don't know. I'm not an engineer. Um, I would say that if someone wanted that, and and I could certainly see a reason for it. Um, although I, I and I have to double check myself because I use the X short key to go back to it. If the, sometimes the exit tool will exit, the exit button will exit out of a tool and take you back to the selection tool. I just press right. X to do that. But, um, you know, if anyone has an idea, if you um, go to uh, forum.vectorworks.net, there are terrific help forums and, you know, user forums and conversations, and there is a place for enhancement requests. So you could, That's go, great. you know, yeah. you could log on, register and go and, and send that direct directly back to the mothership. Right. That's wonderful. And one final question. Why label legends? Why not? <laughs> well, <laughs> <laughs> why not? <laughs> what are you going to do? You're going to print out, draft a plot, print it out, put it on a drafting table and then hand letter the, 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 the channel number around the instrument. Brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really. We used to do that. I like the label legend tool. It, you know, like, like, you know, any piece of software. Um, and and I, 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 we're only talking about Vectorworks. If you wanted me to say this about any of the Adobe products that I use, I'd be happy to go there too. Um, you know, there are things that could use a little love. That might be a tool that could use a little love. Um, you know, now that there are 3D label legends, it just got some love. Um, but, you know, if I want um, if I want to print a plot that has um, information for the electrician that I don't really want to look at or most people don't need to look at, I can have a label legend and I can have, say, the dimmer um, turned off. Personally, I like a label legend that's really clean and that, that dimmer information would actually be something that the electrician would work out and is probably going to enter that into the light write file. I have personal philosophy, you know, everything should be really clear and simple and easy to understand. And I think that the more in information you put in a label legend, um, the more challenging it is to read the plot, especially the m given the more lighting instruments you might have. So I tend to only have the unit number, the channel number, and either the, the, uh, the, col the color in Gobo, if it's a... Um, a conventional unit, <clears throat> simple and clean. I'm sure if, if if you guys wanted to tell us what you have in the label legend, it would be different. It would be arranged differently somehow. Uh, this, you know, with the label legend tool, I can create what I need for different positions. I can modify things in the document, not going through the label legend manager, 
and I can save all of my label legends into a template or stationary file and have them back the next time. Kevin, this is Steve. Let me let me ask a follow up question here. You know, you said you were a late bloomer, but it sounds to me like you're kind of a pioneer. Uh, can you talk a little bit about your relationship with VectorWorks? I think that began when I was invited to beta test. And I think that was probably around 2005. Um, and it, whatever, whatever version of VectorWorks that was, I think it was the first one created to run on a Mac with an Intel chip. And I ran out to buy that Mac to try to get to be a beta tester so that I could have the cool toys before anybody else. Before I was a beta tester, I was an active member of the email lists, which are now the web-based forums that I gave the address for before. Um, and I found those to be a really valuable place for learning. You know, they taught me a lot. I still learn a lot on those things. Um, even when I didn't really know anything, um, I read the forums and I sort of in the back of my head, I would go, okay, I don't know what that is, but now I know, now I know that it exists. And then, you know, six months later I would need to do something and, you know, a light bulb would go off because I remembered that oh, somebody had this problem six months ago or somebody couldn't figure out how to draw this six months ago and they, at least I had an idea of where to look to figure it out. Very cool. I think I have the next question for you, Kevin. And I think, and I think you've touched on this a little bit, but maybe you can drill down a little bit. So broadly, what would you, for, and maybe for students who are just sort of, you know, getting into Vectorworks and really want to produce nice drafting, what would you say are the basic principles of good drafting? I was taught, and I... And I firmly believe that what we show in sketches or previs is what we need to produce for our clients, directors, producers, and our colleagues. I mean, if <clears throat> I'm designing a set and one of you guys is designing, designing the lighting, what I show you in a rendering and where the walls are going to be are really what we should build. Um, good, clear, easily understandable drafting is a critical part of that process. Um, <clears throat> If the electrician doesn't know what light to put exactly where, it's likely there will be a design problem. Or the producer is going to have to pay to move the light, and that's going to probably involve overtime and probably um, not make the producer happy with the lighting designer. I also firmly believe, and I, I learned this when I was um, you know, working for Peter Wexler many years ago, is that over time, when the drawings are clear, the crew show a lot more care and respect for the finished product. If the crew's frustrated, they're not necessarily going to be able to get where they need to go and not necessarily be able to do their best work. So I started by learning to hand draft, and I made a lot of my living for years as a hand draftsman. Um, I think everyone should learn how to hand draft, although I think the priority should now be learning vector works. Um, the principles of hand drafting and communication are still important. We still need to make and, and have clearly understandable uh, notes. Speaking of, speaking of notes, mm -hmm. I, I, I discovered a tool uh, in Vectorworks that I really fell in love with, and it's because I do a lot of work for architects. And, and I wish there was a, maybe a better explanation for how to use it. There's some explanation, but the keynoting tool, mm -hmm. I, really, I really love that tool. Um, I use that I, all the time. And I do have. You? Do you have a database of uh, notes that you draw from? I don't, but I would like to learn. They don't really explain how to use the database, or at least I haven't found it. Maybe it's on the forums. But the reason I love it is because you know, it used to be when we hand drafted, we we put a little note with the beautiful leader line, and I used to make a beautiful squiggly line and a half mm. arrow, and it looked great. And I put the note, but that can clutter up a drawing. So I noticed the architects do keynoting but they just put a number or a letter next to the item, and then there's an index to the keynotes. And I think that's such a beautiful tool, and I don't see many theater people using it too much. Just, oh, maybe I'm wrong. I'm curious well, I, about I, that. I use the keynote kind of on the front, on the front page of my drawing set, uh -huh. um, although I then tend to re reproduce the notes throughout the drawing because I don't, I don't know that everybody's always going to go back to that big set of notes. To go back to the to the drafting, um, you know, in terms of hand drafting, you also there are times when a, when a hard copy of a plot needs to be updated in the theater. So, a lighting designer needs to know how to use a field template, and you know that sounds really simple, but actually putting the pencil in the temple and getting the line to look halfway decent is is a little bit of a challenge. 
There are also times on a film or an event where a designer might have to scratch in the dirt to indicate where to put the, um, the, the, the trucks or where to put the sky trackers. Um, it's crude, but that's still hand drafting. A set designer may wind up in, in a shop somewhere with a pencil and a piece of 1x4 indicating to a carpenter how something needs to be built. Mm -hmm. They could be in a Denny's also with a napkin and a pencil showing you the specifications of Stonehenge. I've never... <laughs> 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 well, no drawing that's is the danger. <laughs> no drawing is ever really complete without a, a coffee or a scotch stain on the nap. <laughs> well, that's what Theron used to say. It was like coffee stain or something like that, right? <laughs> coffee, coffee stains and cigarette burns is, I think, what, that's right. was, was Theron's signature. I um, and cigarettes definitely. <laughs> I, ha I have an assignment when I teach vector works that I give out that I've hand drawn notes with a, my fountain pen, and then I put my drink on it and spilled it and I give it to the students and that's what they have to draft from. I love it. That's um, great. It also, that mean, great. It also <laughs> means they actually have to ask questions because they're obviously they don't have all of the information. Um, you know, my philosophy has always been, and I'm pretty sure this was one of my college teacher is that when I finish the drawings, I should be able to, you know, go outside the building, get hit by a bus and somebody else should be able to finish the design. Yeah. Yep. That's a lot exactly. easier for a set designer than for a lighting designer or a sound designer necessarily, but you know, the idea holds true. Kevin, I have another student question here that came up, and that is 2D versus 3D. What are your thoughts on that? When I first started to use the program, there were only really rudimentary 3D capabilities inside of Vectorworks. There were really very few real 3D programs available at that time for, for you know, for a, for a home computer. Um, and I've always thought, if I'm going to use a computer, why shouldn't I do this in 3D? Um, and so that's what I started to do. Now, initially for renderings, when I would draw a set, at least I could get the, the theater section out of it. I could get sections of details out of it. Um, I couldn't get a rendering because RenderWorks didn't exist yet. So what I would do is either export views to Photoshop and paint them, mm -hmm. or I would export them to another 3D program um, <clears throat> and then render them there. That was clunky. Um, also, if I changed the set design, I had to start over with everything. Mm -hmm. um, for me now, Vectorworks gives you a clean work through from... You know, basic ideation to the, the collaborative process right through to completion. Um, I might still doodle with a pencil and paper, but I can often just start the sketch model in Vectorworks. Um, I'm working on a project right now, at the, and, and I really just started laying squares out to kind of see what I needed in the space. I need this much square footage for this. I need three, four lecterns. Okay. Lectern is 18 inches by 24. I need them here. I need one here. I need to seat 250 people. Grab the grab the seating tool. Basically, just made four sections, each with, you know, 65 people in it, and move them around so that I could space plan. Um, little by little, turn that into a model. Who uh, I'm doing the set. Colleague is doing the lighting, um, <clears throat> so I could. We use project sharing so he could look at the evolution of the set design, start thinking about where, where we could put lights. And, you know, everything in this particular project is really, it's like a rock and roll show where everybody could, uh, where everything is about, can, where can we put a, another, another moving light? What kind of moving light can we put there? We need fog. We need haze. The other idea of the collaboration is that if I'm building the model of the venue, <clears throat> and I do that in a project sharing, or we reference a symbol of the model of the theater. Um, I don't have to complete that all the detail in that right away, and the lighting designer and the sound designer don't have to, you know, trace over the two D program. They have access to the same to the same details. Um, it also allows them to continually continually see a live updated section. Um, just as the set design drawings will regenerate as they, as, as they change. Are you um, using the, uh, the Vectorworks cloud service to do that? 
Um, no, I'm just I'm I'm using Dropbox to do that. Okay. You know, I use the Vectorworks cloud service sometimes to do things like um, uh, some off uh, offline some renderings or to create. Um, I forget what the tool's called. It's in 2018. There's a 360 view export 360 view, mm. so you can literally do kind of a like one of those um, the Facebook 360. Like walk around sort of mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see that the, that the Vectorworks Cloud has a Dropbox integration, and mm -hmm. I haven't gotten I haven't gotten into that yet. But I do like the idea, uh, and Autodesk has it as well, and Adobe these cloud services I think make for great collaboration capabilities. It's really cool. Being able to share information and not being afraid to share your file right. is really important. And your process, it's sort of like sometimes young people, well, I'm not finished with it yet. Well, don't, that's not important if you're not finished. We're just sharing the progress with each other. That's a, it's a team effort. Collaboration is about sharing ideas. It doesn't Absolutely. matter from whom on the team the idea comes from. Yep. It just matters that the best idea ends up in the finished product. Exactly. And, you know, I, I really believe that, you know, I have made other people's work better and I really am sure and I know that other people have made my work better. Amen. So, you know, not being afraid of that is, um, is important. You are listening to Light Talk with the Lumen Brothers. And this week, Light Talk is sponsored by the Instalight Drone Company. Have you ever walked into a theater, looked up and said, damn, I wish I had a lighting position there? Well, no more daydreaming for you. The Instalight Drone Company introduces the new Drone Focus Deluxe. Drone Focus Deluxe. Own the ultimate aeronautical lighting accessory that creates lighting positions out of thin air. The Drone Focus Deluxe will fly your lighting fixture anywhere there is unregulated airspace, <laughs> including over your audience. The Drone Focus Deluxe features insta-variable angle control. It can change altitude in moments, turning your high side light into a shin kicker in seconds. Hey. <laughs> Made with military quality motors and rotors, the Drone Focus Deluxe is powerful enough to lift an ETC luster, a camera, a wireless DMX node, and a battery. In the case of an unlikely power failure, the Drone Focus Deluxe has an auto rotation feature that will safely land your fixture in the orchestra pit. The natural cushioning effect of the musicians will soften the landing. Our new take control feature adds a whole new level of ground control. It will allow you to manually steer your drone to focus its high intensity light to highlight a performer or strobe on that obnoxious audience member who just can't stop playing with their iPhone. Checking out Facebook? Not anymore. <laughs> and for more powerful applications, the Drone Focus Deluxe Mark II will carry a payload of 120 pounds, powerful enough to lift an LED moving light. If any of your audience members have recently taken a shower, the powerful rotors of the Drone Focus Deluxe Mark II will dry their hair in seconds. The Drone Focus Deluxe and the Drone Focus Deluxe Mark II, using our defense budget to create theatrical art. <laughs> <laughs> and now, back to Light Talk. And I have the next question. So you were talking a little bit about RenderWorks, uh, Kevin. And uh, how, what would you say are the basic principles of rendering in general and how to prepare your drawing and your textures, your materials, and, and how to go about that? Keep the overhead low. You know, computers are fast. RenderWorks is fast. VectorWorks is fast. But nothing is ever fast enough. <laughs> That's for sure. You know, the first thing is to decide what to model and how best to model the details. And then mm. use classes to, to determine what's seen and, and where it's seen. So I'm, I'm working right now on a, <clears throat> with 829 to create a schematic design for a more ergonomic tech table. None of us have the backs or wrists to sit through the conditions we experience in the theater. Mm. So in my model, I have all kinds of details like bolts, nuts, washers, wing nuts, they're great to explain the concept of something that has to come apart, go back together and fit in a place, <clears throat> angle, adjust, and slide in and out. So that's great. If it's a stage prop, if it's a custom lighting fixture, I would include those on the mechanical drawings. But in the rendered views, I would probably turn, turn all those details off, mm -hmm. sign them in their own class, get rid of them so that the computer isn't having to think about all that complex geometry. Right. Um, I do a lot of custom textures for scenery. So if I'm creating a 22-foot by 50-foot stage backdrop, 
I might use Photoshop to create the image or to scan a painting. Um, if I just do that and I'm going to give it to a scenic, that might be a you know 50 megabyte file. If I'm going to print that backdrop, it might be more than 10 gigabytes. I'm not going to use that 10 gigabyte file in Vectorworks. Um, everybody should have a little bit of knowledge about printing and DPI, and you know <clears throat> that's all in my book. Um, but if I'm going to put that backdrop on stage, I'll create a Photoshop or a JPEG file at the final dimensions because that helps me keep it kind of straight in my mind how that's going to map onto an object. But I use a really low DPI. So if I have a 22-foot um, by 50-foot texture, it might only be 5 DPI. And I generally try to keep those files under 2 megabyte so that I'm not clogging vector works with a lot of huge textures. My thought is I'm probably going to output that image either on a tabloid size page or in a larger set of drawings, but probably no bigger than a tabloid size page. If I need to make a poster of that rendering, I might increase the size of my textures um, for the rendering output because I was going to you know, print it at 30 inches by 40 inches. Uh, lights add geometry. Lights complicate things, Right. Um, whether they're spotlight lighting devices or vector works light objects, I use as few as possible in the rendering to make it work. And I'm talking about using render works, not vision. Um, and I try to avoid the point light object because all they do is add math. Um, you know, if, if, if you think of a point light, it's basically a light bulb in the middle of, in the middle of a room and the rays of light are bouncing off of everything and, att and attacking everything. The more you add, the more the more math you're adding, the longer your rendering time. And keep the polygon count low. Okay, great. So why, why don't you tell us a little bit how Vectorworks uh, works with Previs? I mean, do you use it to Previs? I do. I mean, you know, I, I start as I'm a huge fan of still images rather than, than video. Um, I think I'm still, you know, shell-shocked from what video was 20 years ago on a, on, on a computer. But I think stills are a great place to start, and I think you know when you take a, take a show into into vision and can really literally show the whole show to the director offline. I think that's phenomenal. Um, but I also think stills are a great way to um, process your your ideation. So you know before starting a light plot and before putting you know 600 units down and turning them on and trying to look at it. I use the Vectorworks light objects. Um, they're in the visualization tool set. And, you know, I just throw a couple of spotlights up there. Um, they're not necessarily perfectly focused, but if I'm lighting the set and I want to see how the colors I'm going to use, I can pick, um, I can use any, any RGB value, I can use any hexadecimal value, I can pick any stock gel color there in the Vectorworks libraries. I can put it into that, that object and light, put it on the, on the set and light the set and take a look at it. Um, I can also render something. I, I can, I, this is where, this is the only place I would use OpenGL is I could do those renderings and change the colors for myself um, using OpenGL to look at it, make quick changes, get it to a point, either fast render works, final render works, or a render work style send it out, send it to the director, and discover that the director doesn't like yellow. And then I can fix that, whether it's the yellow in the set or the yellow in the lights. Um, you know, as a producer, there's huge amounts of money wasted um, in tech because mm -hmm. there are hours and hours and hours where we're setting light levels and working on things in the theater that the carpenters could be working, the actors could be working, you know, on Broadway, that's just a massive amount of crew time when really you could put the lighting designer and a programmer and an assistant in a room with a, you know, 50-gallon drum of coffee and um, let them pre the show. I have a follow-up on that because years ago, I've been a big pre advocate for probably 15, 16 years, and I remember some of the responses I got from the Broadway community was, you know, I don't want to light the show twice. I want to come in once and light it once. 
And and I and I kind of wonder has that has that attitude shifted? Are people doing previs work now for commercial theater on Broadway? I, I I don't know if they're doing it for commercial theater on Broadway. I know they're certainly do you know certainly rock and roll has done it for a long time. Oh sure, absolutely. Um, I th- yeah. Opera opera does it. Um, mm-hmm. Fashion does it. Um, you know the my colleague who first introduced me to Vision was like, look, I can I can go sit in a room. I can take you know I can, I can pre-program the show. I can take it into the theater, or I can bring the director into the studio, show him or her the animation. We can make a few adjustments. I take the the USB drive, I take it to the theater, I put it in the board, and then I spend an hour touching it up. Yep, I, I, I've done it myself. I've had students do it. I think it's fantastic, and and uh, I'd like to see it adopted even more more broadly. I would so. too. Yeah, for some reason it's not. I mean, that's what we did at the Rural Opera House. Um, I, I we basically lit the show in previs over a three day period mm-hmm. using Vision, by the way. Mm-hmm. <laughs> this it's like five years ago, and uh, and then just we only had like maybe a couple of hours of just lighting time, pure lighting time in the theater, and then we just cleaned it up over the rehearsals. We even achieved it in Academia. We had a, did Chicago. The set was done in Vectorworks. The lighting student took that two D set put it into a visualizing software, built it up in 3D, did his light plot in Vectorworks, but then re- duplicated it pretty quickly in a visualizer, plugged in the board, pre- uh, queued the whole show. We were all didn't know how it was going to work. Took that jump drive, like you said, down into the theater, put it in the board, and started stepping through the queues. And we were like, this was an automation, which was pre-focused. And we were like, we were amazed at how close it was. And you did have to still touch it, but it was really... Well, it's not that close because you're talking about 2D versus 3D. And uh, no, until we, we get... Two, no, we did it in 3D. No, no, but you're watching it in 2D. Yes, You did it in true. 3D, but you're looking at a 2D image being projected somewhere. Uh, I mean, when this will all change is when they perfect v- uh, virtual reality into these visualization programs so you actually see it in 3D. Well, that's when we can have the, the lighting console that's not really a touch, not really a touch screen, but in, in the air, and you can just put your, um, <clears throat> t- touch, it, touch the spot on the stage where you want all the moving lights to focus. Right. Well, that's Drone Focus Deluxe. We have that. <laughs> but, 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 but no, seriously, you know, one of our listeners has asked us to talk about virtual yeah. reality. We were talking about it about 20 episodes ago as mm-hmm. a joke, you know, but wouldn't it be cool for the first visualizing program, you know, to actually have a VR component? You know, I did see uh, a, a, a young lady who works for uh, a theater consulting firm in New York showed us a prototype that they had developed in their office. And basically, you put on this goggle, and and then you you can basically push a button and put yourself in any seat in the theater, and you would be placed in that seat in 3D virtual reality. So you And that's how they were testing for sight lines from mm-hmm. every single seat. Yeah, that they have. I know that. But but they I don't think they have the horsepower yet to actually see a light show in 3D. No, that, no that's something else. Right. That, yeah, that's, that and, that's, and that's definitely a, a horsepower thing and a polygon thing. You know, I tell people yep. to um, check sight lines with a camera, with a, with the camera Perhaps. object. <laughs> yeah, um, that works. You, know, you could still draw, draw the lines the way that we were taught in hand drafting, but if you put a camera there, you can see backstage or not if you've done it right. Um, you know, uh, on the question of horsepower, one thing that we're looking at doing in our uh, computer lab is to uh, turn it into a render forum so that what you've got the computing power of 12 or 14 or 50 computers in your building that when they're not being used, it's a way to harness that processing power. And that may be the way in which we get to that point, David. That, that could possibly be it. And one of the things that I do is <clears throat> I'm a um, guest scholar at Carnegie Mellon University. And when I go out, I get to talk to the Department of Drama, but it's the Entertainment Technology Center that brings me out. Yeah, and they are essentially the graduate school of game design. Excellent. Um, right. But, Those are the people. <laughs> but it's it's much yeah. it's much more than just gaming, in, and they have people that have all kinds of diverse interests. Right. Um, and um, I know there's a, a VR project that I'm supposed to talk to some students like next week about. But you know, last semester I saw something that was a city planning tool. Mm-hmm. So they kind of built up a couple of neighborhoods yeah. and modeled them 
modeled around them in really low poly, you know, simple cubes. Um, but then you could walk through the neighborhood. And if somebody wanted to put a high rise into the neighborhood, they could turn on a high rise. And you could see how the high rise would affect the streetscape as sure. opposed the, to, the, and it was sunlight. a pretty yeah. sunlight. It was, a, it was yeah. a relatively, you know, it was a three, four or five story kind of neighborhood. Um, so you could see how that would affect everybody around it. You could see what it would be like if you put in 50 high rises. Um, wow, that's cool. But, was it in a, but, VR, a VR format or projected on a flat surface? VR format. Right. So you had to put the goggles on and you navigated right. your way through with the um, uh, with a with a controller that right. appeared you, you had a hand controller like a gaming controller yeah. and and what you did with it kind of appeared on the screen on the, in, in space um, but but there was kind of no lighting and there was minimal atmosphere although they could show you a, a sunny day a cloudy day and maybe maybe right. some semblance of rain um, but yeah, you're talking about a lot of horsepower. A lot of horsepower. Yeah, but the day is going to come, and it'll probably come in our lifetime, and I think that's really going to change everything. Oh, absolutely. Uh, I have no yeah. doubt. And you, you, you know, I just saw something in Japan. Um, you know, at SMU, we have a gaming center also called Guild Hall. And I was in Japan, and I, they said, let me take you. We're going to show you a new 3D game. And I thought, yeah, yeah, 3D game. So they, t- they take me into the studio. There's a, a, a computer setting there. And they say, sit down. So I sit down, and they turn on a NASCAR racing game. And in front of me on the table is a 3D NASCAR. I'm not wearing goggles. I I feel like that Mel Brooks movie, I think, Frankenstein, where you're grasping at the notes in the air. (laughs) It's right there in front of me. And I've got a virtual wheel. Oh, wow. And that that wheel allows me to turn that car. Is it holographic, Steve? It was holographic. It, Real it, hologram, it was absolutely not, not amazing. just a Pepper's Ghost? <laughs> no, it wasn't a Pepper's Ghost. And the the discussion they were having, oddly enough, was that probably it had no future as a game, but it had a future as a sales tool. So you could you could walk through a shopping mall in Japan, and when you walked past a store, a little clerk would pop up in the hallway in front of you because they were reading off of your uh, credit card that you had gotten from the store. So it would say, hey, Steve, we got those new blue jeans you like so much. And she or he would lead you into the store, and another hologram would pick you up and walk you to a real sales clerk. Let me, let me throw this one out, since we're all sharing this kind of story. So we have, like, you got, like the Carnegie Mellon Center uh, and uh, what you have at there at SMU, Steve, we have a, a Digital Worlds Institute. And one of the most fascinating things they've been doing recently with this VR Let's say, and they're doing this actually, so let's say you are going in to have back surgery. What they are doing is they are uh, 3D MRIing your back, and then they are putting that spine into a virtual body, putting, you, putting the surgeons in the goggles, and then they are literally rehearsing the surgery on your virtual body to get it into their muscle memory before they go into surgery. So because every back is different, everybody's anatomy is not perfect, you're literally taking your anatomy, digitizing it, putting it into VR, and letting the surgeons then practice the surgery in advance. How remarkable is that? That is very, that is, that is very cool. Now, and, and, and just to, to kind of bring it back to our, our world. No, no, no. Th- this is much more interesting than <laughs> you're talking about before. No, but I mean, I you, mean know, you guys th- are working at real, real universities. My university's still trying to figure out the abacus. I mean, you know, just, the th- I mean really, guys. Oh, man. Okay, okay. Back, well, back, back to life. Back to our but, but, world. No, no, no. Back just, to life. Just, just, I mean, just on the same theory, as long as you can export a 3D model, um, and I don't know if I've touched on what, you know, BIM, you know, which oh, I'm yeah. sure you guys know. You know. Bu- building information management, sure. Yeah, as long as, is, is, you know, I'm waiting Not for the day, and I think actually this software exists, is you can export the model to a sound program, and as long as there's BIM information on what the materials are you're using, 
So if <clears throat> you ha if the, 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 the orchestra seating has a certain amount of steel in it, it has a certain amount of cushion, if the walls are whatever wood they are and are angled whatever, you can play back the sound so it'll hear, it will sound like it's there. As, as, well, as well as your headphones or ear, earbuds can, can do that. Now take that, think about the, the Apple AR kit that's in, at least now I think it's just in iOS. But when you think about that kind of technology in virtual reality, someday soon, they're really going to be able to hear the soundscape for a show offline, really the way that it's going to sound in the theater, the way that we're, we're talking about that we can visualize lighting. Well, Kevin, uh, what, what real advice do you have for anyone young starting out in this business? Run away. Run away now. Run away! <laughs> um, but I mean, seriously, I mean, I think we all do this because we love it. We do this because we have found ways to, you know, earn a living and, you know, put a roof over our head and, you know, heat, food, air conditioning, clothes, all that stuff. Um, but it, it takes doing the work. Um, you know, when I was first working as an assistant it, back in the dark ages, I practiced my hand drafting and my lettering every night. You know, I might be watch, might have been watching television, but I was watching television at my drafting table and practicing my skills. I built small model pieces. I learned to be clean, accurate, and fast, and that increased my value as an assistant. Um, I also learned to make a wicked cup of coffee. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, and I don't know if I talked about this before or not, but some of this, some of these things are just, you know, when you get out of school, what is it that you have to sell? What is it that is going to right. make you valuable to somebody else? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, obviously being a brilliant designer is one of them, you know, but it's uh, odds are you're not probably going to go to Broadway the day you get out of school. Um, odds are you're probably going to be someone's assistant. So, you know, are you a master at light, right? Are you a, can you, can you work vision? How many boards can you program that you can use with Vision? Or how many of the, the soft apps for the, for the various languages can you use so you can, you can go and take some designer's notes and the plot and go sit in a dark room and rough out what that designer sees? Um, how good are you as a, um, as a vector worker? Um, you know, I also always tell people to, you know, you're probably going to need a day job. Don't 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 sling hash. Don't don't wait tables unless you really have to, but sling a wrench. If mm -hmm. you're slinging a wrench, and if you're in you know cities that have an entertainment industry, there'll be an opportunity even if you're a dancer to sling a wrench, hang some lights, and network with the other people there. They'll all be people in your in your circumstances. These are all networking opportunities. So you know. If you're a set designer and you're hanging lights and you're talking to the guy next to you or the woman next to you who happens to be a lighting designer, that may be the contact to the next director who's going to hire you. Um, there are also lots of non-traditional places to look for that kind of work, weddings, parties. Um, figure out what your weaknesses are. First, admit that you have weaknesses. Um, that's really hard for um, any of us to do, particularly when you're very young, um, and work on them, fix them, correct them. Interview as much as you can. Um, interviews are great experiences to learn about how you can you know, convince people to hire you, sell yourself, what you need to do. Oh, I didn't dress right that time, didn't get the job. I'll, I'll, I'll dress you know, a little nicer next time. Um, <clears throat> You know, networking, I, I can't stress networking enough. You know, if you're in a place and everybody goes to have a drink somewhere after the call and you're not on the call, well, go there. Hang out. Don't get wasted. You know, just talk to people. Make them aware of you and what you can do. Um, <clears throat> read plays. See shows. Go to the movies. The texts are the common language that we all make reference to. You know, you may not have the answer to the magic at the end of Blythe Spirit, but you ought to know what the moment is that I'm talking about when I said that. And if you don't, you should go read the play. 
Um, find out whose work you like. Um, you know, if you're in New York, go to a Broadway show. If you're a lighting designer and you like the lighting, look at the poster, look at the program, and call that person. S go meet with them, have a cup of coffee, interview with them, ask them for advice. Odds are they'll help you. And learn to make a great cup of coffee. <laughs> Kevin, thank, thank you so much. Thank you so much for sitting down and talking with us today. Really appreciate it. Yeah, yeah Kevin, it's great having you here, man. It was great. Yeah. Well, you know that Hammond organ solo you hear in the background tells us that once again you spent a precious hour of your life listening to Light Talk. Look for the next episode of Light Talk here on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play Music, SoundCloud, Spotify, or the Light Talk Facebook group page. And while you are there, post your comments and questions and be sure to subscribe to Light Talk. Regarding the accuracy of our statements and opinions, no guarantees are offered. In other words, what Steve is saying, don't burn down your theater. <laughs> Light Talk is written and produced by the Lumen Brothers, coming to you from Long Beach, Gainesville, and the Republic of Texas. And don't forget to keep those questions and comments coming. You can email us at David, Stan, or Steve at lighttalk.org. And be sure to tune in next week when we discuss how to increase your client network, who the hell is Kleagle, what to do when you hit a design wall, can you find a great LED moving head in the 2000 to 4000 range, and we even discuss the Olympics. All that and a new sponsor. We'll see you next week. Same time, same channel. Bye-bye, everybody. See you all later. Bye-bye. Bye-bye from Light Talk. Sing it, Theo. Light Talk.